Don't you want to heal faster? Being fit is a superpower in this context. The wound heals based on perceived time, the time the clock tells you. Clearly, people are healing themselves faster. Most people associate pain with some physical injury in their body, and a lot of times we know that's not the case. Our bodies are extremely good at going from zero to 60, but we're not as good at going from 60 to zero without actually having a breakdown. We have so much research from different studies showing um, just how helpful pain education can be. You know, there's so much fear and anxiety around pain when you're injured. We were talking about that before. You know, you just don't know, like, what's going on? Is this serious? Uh, most people most people associate pain with some physical injury in their body, and a lot of times we know that's not the case. So there's a lot about pain education that can help reduce fear and anxiety and um, just get people moving in the right direction so they don't become so fearful that they stop moving mm -hmm. and suffer all those other, you know, deconditioning, atrophy, all those things that happen when you are sedentary and increase your risk of injury later. So, you know, when you look at the definition of pain, kind of the main body out there is the International Association for the Study of Pain. And the definition for pain nowadays is basically an unpleasant physical or emotional experience that they say is associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And I think that part, actual or potential tissue damage, is really important. And that's a it's a recent change probably in the last 15 years um, but most people again will think if I have pain I have actual tissue damage that's something I've torn a muscle or I've torn a ligament or you know I've I've torn my meniscus I've done something like that and really we have a lot of cool studies showing that your brain we know pain comes from the brain now from these studies but it's this experience outputted by the brain um, in response to perceived threat or danger so we see situations where people will actually have pain when there's no tissue damage, but they believe there's the potential for it. And when you can make people believe there's the potential for tissue damage, you can create pain. So there's kind of crazy studies. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them out of Australia. Uh, one of the most known pain neuroscientists is located in Australia, and he does a lot of study on this. So it's a fascinating area. Um, you know, just the brain in general is fascinating and pain is no different. Pain was looked at in this sort of linear relationship. Um, it was called the Cartesian model, which is basically you would have something, basically pain came from the tissues of the body. So, mm -hmm. and it would just, so you slammed your finger or you burned your hand or something. And basically the thought was, oh, you've got these pain sensors or receptors in your tissue that relay that pain message up to your spinal cord, up to your brain, and then tell your brain, hey, there's pain down here. You got to do something about it. Uh, and really, the more recent research on it has shown that we it's more appropriate to think about it as danger receptors. We call them nociceptors. So they're these small nerve endings in the nervous system that basically detect high threshold stimuli. So if you think about, like if you were squeezing your finger, if you slowly increase the pressure, in the beginning it's just pressure, right? But at a certain point you can activate those nociceptors, those high threshold receptors, those those sensors, and they will then relay a danger message. So that's nociception. It literally stands for danger reception. And so that nociceptive message will travel to different regions of your brain. And then your brain basically decides, is it, should I create pain? Mm, and that's right. um, looking at everything in the environment. Your brain is constantly weighing the situation because there are times where it's good to output pain when you have nociception, right? To Because pain at the end of the day is about survival and protecting you and keeping you alive. So there are times, obviously, when nociception is coming in, you've got these danger messages coming into the nervous system, into the brain, and you want to output pain to protect the organism. But then there are times where outputting pain could actually be harmful, you know? So one of the, one of the examples that's given quite a bit for this is if you're crossing the, a busy street and you twist your ankle, if you're out in that lane, having pain in that moment is not ideal because you're going to change how you move. You're going to slow down. You risk being hit by a car or a bus or something, you know? And so your brain has ways of blocking no nociception. You can even almost like a dimmer switch, you can turn it down um, and basically blunt that response so that pain isn't created so that you can get out of that situation and be safe. And we see this all kinds of things like athletes, um, mm -hmm. soldiers, there's all kinds of stories of 
really traumatic physical insults where the person experienced no pain. Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe later they felt pain when they were safe, but not in that moment. You gave the example of this guy having a bullet in his neck. <laughs> totally. And then it's showing up on a scan yeah. later. It's like, oh, there's a bullet in there, I guess. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, that there's all kinds of ones like that where people have had these traumatic things. I mean, that guy, yeah, bullet in the neck, goes in for some other issue. They're doing a scan on his neck and discover there's a bullet in his neck. And for whatever reason, his nervous system just didn't think of it as threatening, so he never experienced pain with it. So... It's pain's a, it's a super internet interesting experience. It varies, obviously. We we all vary in terms of our pain perception and threshold. And um, I talk about it. They talk about it in the pain neuroscience world is um, they call them neurosignatures. These patterns of areas of the brain that fire when creating pain. It's almost like a fingerprint. You know, it's a lot of the same areas, but people are different. You know, if you take people with back pain, low back pain even if their symptoms are somewhat similar, if you look at their brains, the pattern of neurons that fire to create their individual pain is different in each person. Yeah, that, that's also fascinating too, is that no two people experience pain the same way. Mm -hmm. In the history of humanity, all of us have a unique kind of signature, like you said, our fingerprint when yeah. it comes to pain. And it's based on, obviously, um, we've got these sensors in the cell, and we're gonna talk about that in a moment. Our, our brain and nervous system, but also our perception of things and also stress levels, mm -hmm. various stress inputs that you talk about. And just to unpack this a little bit more, I want to talk about, you know, you also highlight something really important in the book that pain is valuable. We mm -hmm. see pain as just bad. We just want to get away from all pain. Pain is bad. But pain is a really valuable kind of uh, educator mm -hmm. in our system. For sure. Pain is a great teacher. I think when the nervous system, it can get tricky when people have chronic pain, you know, and even in those situations, a lot of times it, it still is a teacher and it can help you help inform if you can be aware and try to really cue in on all these factors that can influence pain, not just the physical body, but your thoughts and beliefs and stress and sleep hygiene and nutrition and all of these things that can influence your nervous system and can sensitize it. There's so many of those factors that people aren't aware of. And I think when you learn about those, this is where pain education can become important. When you learn about those, you become aware of them and you can start looking at what is, why is this pain occurring and what is it telling me about my life? Most people will only think about pain as what's wrong with my knee? You know, what's wrong is, is my, do I have arthritis? Do I have a meniscus tear? They will try to blame all pain on something in the physical body and for sure, there are situations of pain that are very much associated with the biological system in your body, but lots of people have pain. I have a pain uh, issue in the right side kind of of my thoracic spine that started six years ago pretty much at this point that um, started from a physical injury. I was in jiu-jitsu and I hurt a rib. And uh, it was at a time period in life that was stressful. I was in a stressful job. There was just a lot going on. My kids were young. Just... I was kind of ramped up and to this day that tissue is healed right there's no injury back there anymore but if i get stressed out um, particularly that seems to be the trigger even if it's positive stress like i'm about to go on vacation that spot will start hurting mm. so you know we know from the research that uh, you know our endocrine system uh, different neurotransmitters in the nervous system when those things are in your bloodstream cortisol elevated cortisol levels with stress those things can sensitize your nervous system. And so it's really important to be aware of all these factors that influence pain. And uh, again, can be a really powerful teacher. If you can really try to focus in on it and think about it, um, a lot of times it can help you identify these things that might be off in your life. Usually that pain is trying to tell you something. You know, something's not right, almost like a balance. There's something maybe out of balance in your life. Um, and I think for a lot of people that and in a lot of cases, if pain persists, is related to stress, um, poor sleep, and nutrition factors, you know, and, and probably a lack of exercise and just general movement, too. And there's grades of injuries, and so you've got to think about most of these things where somebody would be immobilized like that relate to tendon and ligament injuries. You know, fractures, of course, too. Like a fracture is kind of a different beast, and if you have a fracture that uh, needs to be immobilized, that's kind of maybe the one time you'd really think, like, Mm, this is probably necessary depending on how severe or complicated that fracture is. But man, when you get into soft tissue injuries, this was actually just published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. But now we look at this, um, it used to be rice, right? Everybody heard rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation. That's kind of changed over time. And so 
you know, when you look at these new, the new research on soft tissue injuries, which would be tendons and ligaments, most things in the physical body, there, none of that is immobilized. Actually, it's movement. You want to be mobilizing and moving the area. And of course, that's respecting your symptoms and your function at the same time. But just like your example, if somebody walks in and can complete many functional tasks without symptoms, and they don't show some other signs like maybe, you know, this wouldn't happen so much in the ankle, but maybe somebody tore their ACL. Maybe they have severe knee instability. And so they, maybe they don't have pain, but they can't control their joint and the risk of injuring other structures like the meniscus or other ligaments. Maybe there's a place for partially immobilizing them. Rarely is it full immobilization like the boot you're talking about. But if somebody comes in being able to do some of those tasks without symptoms, no way. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to fully immobilize them. And it really should be more because again, you do that and you for sure are going to cause disuse atrophy. Everything's going to decondition. And then to tell the person that they can just wear that and then go back to normal life is hugely irresponsible because now they are deconditioned. The soft tissue injury risk is way higher because our body does not waste energy maintaining muscle mass and, and, you know, tendon thickness, ligament thickness, things like that when it doesn't need to spend that energy. So, you are going to atrophy and that tissue is going to weaken, the capacity of that tissue will drop. And so if you come out of being immobilized and just, I'm going to go play basketball, well, now your risk of rupturing your Achilles is way higher. So we talk about this a lot in, with physical tissues, kind of the capacity of that physical tissue. You have to kind of, that's a good way to think about for people is that our musculoskeletal system is extremely robust and adaptable. And a lot of times when people are in pain, they start thinking that they're fragile, you know, that they're, they're going to break, something's going to happen. And so a lot of it is trying to reassure people really physical therapy is mostly therapy. And the longer I've been in it, a huge part of it for pain is really therapy. And it's really trying to reassure people that the musculoskeletal system can adapt and change when you expose it to the right levels of stress. And Yes, sometimes there is a place for being immobilized and letting something heal. But being immobilized means that there's absolutely very minimal stress on the system and you're not going to help encourage an increase in that capacity of those tissues. So if you don't have horrible symptoms, you don't have a bunch of pain, you're not showing other signs that um, if they were present could lead to other injuries of other structures, then yeah, of course you really want to keep moving in the ways that you can and then with gradual increases in stress build up the capacity of that tissue and that's usually mostly resistance training you know resistance training has by far the most evidence and that's mostly you know mobility things like that have a place of course early in rehab but most of it is on strengthening like you want to strengthen tissue and if you're immobilized it's for sure getting weaker your field is one of the most valuable and you said it before i was going to say this before you even said it the therapy part of it, that's what's overlooked because it's not just it's it's not just the psychological aspect, but you have therapy through movement too. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful combination. Yeah, it's huge. I think I really think of myself more now as sort of a coach for people because you know, people have to have the mindset that getting better from pain and injury requires active participation in most cases you know you have to as the individual take responsibility for your body and actively participate too many people think of it as just this passive thing i'll go get a you know i'll go see the doctor and they'll give me some medication uh, i'll go to the chiropractor they'll adjust me and that'll fix it um, i'll get a massage and that will fix it and while there is a place for a lot of those things temporarily by far, the research shows that these active things like education, movement, and exercise have way better evidence in the long term for uh, not only rehabilitation, but the kind of prehab idea of like helping to prevent injuries. Or, or, I want to say prevent because that's never 100%, right? Like we all get injured. It's reducing the risk of suffering an injury. And so, you know, that component is so important for people to understand. And I think when you understand more about the science of pain and injury, well, not only are you less fearful uh, when you do have those things come up, less anxious about what it means, uh, you can kind of, I know for me having this background, when I have pain or an injury, most things we get are more just kind of like irritations. You know, it doesn't mean something's like really torn or damaged. 
in most cases, you know, and so when you know that and you have that mindset and you have a plan, right, anything in life that is unknown is scary. And so that's totally true of pain. When you don't fully understand it, you're more likely to be scared of it and threatened and feel anxious and fearful. And those things have been shown to actually make pain worse in a lot of time. In a lot of cases, you know, people will become more hyper vigilant. They'll stress about it. And we see that when people move from like an acute pain state to a chronic pain state, there's usually those kind of factors where there's stress, anxiety, hyper vigilance, fear, and those things kind of wind up the nervous system and make it more sensitive. So, you know, understanding pain and injury helps to reduce some of those thoughts and emotions, and it gives you a path forward. And I think because there's so much evidence for active things like um, movement, exercise, of course, there's lots of other factors that we talk about in the book you want to think about, but because there's so much evidence for those, you can do those on your own. And if you are willing to take responsibility, you can pick up something like a book that has programs that aren't obviously aren't tailored to you specifically. It's not like I did an evaluation and gave you this program. But if you know how to modify based on paying attention to your symptoms, guidelines that are outlined in the book, you can cr take the programs, create programs for yourself, and basically make your body more resilient, get past pain and injury on your own. And I think that's a huge thing for people. Again, it's okay to go see a practitioner. Of course, you're not getting better. Go see someone if you want to implement some of these passive interventions temporarily. I still do manual therapy on people. I'll work on them and do things as kind of a jump start to get rid getting rid of pain. But the message at the end of the day should be there's a ton of things that you can do on yourself and those have the best evidence in the long run. Whether it's from recovering from exercise and getting that beautiful adaptation that we want, mm -hmm. or whether it's healing from an injury, mm -hmm. you share in the book that that process is really dependent upon our ability to shift over to our parasympathetic nervous system. That's where the healing really hits light, lightning speed. Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, I think our bodies are extremely good at going from zero to 60 and like maintaining there. Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a high stress person. I love just go, go, go. But we're not as good at going from 60 to zero without actually having a breakdown, right? A lot of people just, they just crash. They're so exhausted, they fall on the couch with the TV on and pass out. And that's not really recovery, right? So how, how can we improve our recovery endurance? How can we tolerate being in relaxation states that do help with uh, tissue turnover with the the correct hormone balance with um, tissue repair all of that what can we do for ourselves that isn't just you know being left for dead all the time after we've burnt ourselves to a crisp so what the book really does is it tries to amplify novel ways that you can increase your parasympathetic tolerance and so there are four main tools that I focus on breathe roll, which is self-massage, move, and then non-sleep deep rest or yoga nidra. And this is like a compound pharmacy that truly makes you feel like a, a massive difference, body-wide difference, that will end up actually making you even better at your sympathetic output. Yeah, and all of this is tied to better outcomes with obviously our performance, but also surprisingly with our mental health, our mm -hmm. emotional well-being, We'll talk about all that stuff, of course. But I want to share this direct quote from your book. Okay. You say that our bodies come wired with an exquisite relaxation response. And that's kind of counter culture or counter paradigm. Like you just said, we're really good at going zero to 100 or zero sure. to 60. 120. But going <laughs> the, res the reverse is a lot more difficult, but it's not supposed to be like that. Your body ha actually has a system built in. Mm -hmm to kind of reverse engineer that stress. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about this. You say that our breath is our built-in reset button. Mm -hmm. All right. When I think of a reset button, I think of the first Nintendo. Super Mario Brothers just came out mm -hmm. as of this recording. All right. And there was like two buttons, power, reset. Yeah. All right. But we have a built-in reset button for all of this stuff, and it's our breath. Why is that? Your breath will breathe for you whether you pay it any mind or not. It's amazing. It is this completely automatic thing that's happening 
up to 22,000, 24,000 times a day, depending on who you're citing. Um, but if we are able to consciously control the rhythm of our breath and the cadence of our breath and how we're breathing, you can change your brain. You can change state. And it happens within just a few moments. So there's wonderful research by, um, I highlight in the book by Jack Feldman, who's a, actually a local neuroscientist. He's at UCLA. I mean, he's literally like just over the hill. Jack Feldman discovered in the brainstem the two different places that generate inhales and exhales. And they, they didn't know where these were located until 1991, or they didn't know where inha inhale was coming. They knew it was coming from the brain, but they didn't know exactly where in the brain stand. So he found this location called the pre-Botzinger complex. But one of the things that he found was that the, the, the initiation for inhale is coming from there, but that initiation doesn't just go to the nerve that directs the diaphragm to contract. So the diaphragm contracts because a nerve called the phrenic nerve is telling it to contract. The diaphragm, which is your main breathing muscle, um, like any skeletal muscle, it needs a nerve to say, all right, contract now. So when this pre or complex or when the nerves within that tell the phrenic nerve to contract, they're also sending signals to lots of different parts of your brain. They're sending signals into areas that control emotion. They're sending signals that are also um, involved with the olfaction system, which makes a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. Our olfactory bulb. So they're going to many, many places throughout the brain, and they're also generating brain waves. Breathing has its own brain wave oscillation that's happening all the time. So it's not just affecting your ability to breathe in and out. Those Brain waves are doing things to different parts of their, our brain that right now nobody really knows what those things are. But it seems pretty important that for some reason it's kicking off these waves that are happening all over the place globally. But one of the things that we know is if you change the rates of inhales and exhales, and um, there, there, there are a number of studies that have looked at them, but not like, they, we still need a lot more breath science and I think we're in the new age of a burgeoning time of breath science to be able to learn more and more what are the ideal patterns that help certain individuals and obviously there's never one thing that works for everybody um, but you can change your moment-to-moment -moment experience by adjusting how it is you're breathing and that's really really powerful but I don't want you to get lost in your head about breathing because breathing is a body-wide experience, which is why I wrote the book, Body by Breath, not Brain by Breath. I mean, the brain is super important, but breathing is really a body-wide experience that affects yeah. literally every system and structure of your body. I wanna ask you about this because this is very likely the most important muscle that we don't train, the most important muscle that we're not really informed on this might be the most important muscle, and you said it already, the diaphragm, all right? So please give us a masterclass understanding on the diaphragm as a muscle. The respiratory diaphragm is, in my opinion, the most significant skeletal muscle in the human body. It is the hub around which all of your body orchestrates itself. It's this odd shaped trampoline like semicircle locked into your rib cage. And if you've ever eaten a skirt steak, by the way, you've eaten cow diaphragm. So that might be a reference point for some people if, you know, if they're meat eaters, right? The skirt steak, it looks like a skirt, looks like a, a big hoop. And you have a right sided and a left sided diaphragm. You have right side rib cage left side rib cage so we we have a little bit of difference on the right and left side just to accommodate the shape of the liver on top of your respiratory diaphragm is your heart so your heart sits directly onto what's known as the central tendon of the diaphragm so as you breathe your heart is always going along for a ride with the diaphragm mm. the diaphragm also attaches to your lumbar spine and so um, a lot of people with low back pain one of the uh, very conservative and, and smart things 
to start doing is to do deep breathing because of that relationship. But the diaphragm is a, attached to so many different tissues, both above and below, that are instrumental in generating core strength, postural integrity. The diaphragm itself is a passageway. I mean, diaphragm actually means partition. And so it's a, it's a passageway that allows for the, the, the input of food to be able to go down into this sort of, I don't want to say dirty, nasty area, but you don't want all this stuff coming up and getting into your lungs. So the diaphragm acts as a partition and a passageway to separate lungs and heart from visceral organs. The diaphragm is also a, a pump. It is constantly moving down and up as you breathe. And this pump action that the diaphragm has, it's like bouncing your organs below it. By the way, if your diaphragm weren't there, your organs would just kind of float up into your throat and out your eyeballs. It would be a mess. So the diaphragm acts as a, as a, a gatekeeper to make sure that your organs stay where they need to be. And of course, if anybody is listening has a hiatal hernia, you know how problematic it is when your organs start to float up within the diaphragm, your stomach pooches up and this is a miserable condition. So the diaphragm helps to generate force for pushing matter out, right? So we use it to bear down to have our bowel movements. Um, we use it to urinate. We use it to cough, to get things out of our lungs. Mm -hmm. So it's moving stuff that's in the visceral region out into the toilet, but it's, or a baby out into the world, mm -hmm. right? Or it's generating forces that can help move fluid out of the lungs. And obviously the diaphragm became very important in the last three years when people were having this you know, insane amount of lung infection due to the pandemic. So um, one of the really cool things about the diaphragm, I think that everybody should probably know, uh, is related to aging. So your, your diaphragm is equipped with some of the most special muscle fibers known to the human body. I mean, your, your diaphragm is the one skeletal muscle that will go on contracting, even if you're passed out drunk, even if you fall asleep, it has to keep contracting in order for you to stay alive. There's no other skeletal muscle you have that's gonna do that for you. Mm. So it has these very specialized fiber types that are so enduring, but it also has fast twitch muscle fiber types um, that help for generating tremendous force, for example, in the case of childbirth. I mean, we always think of the uterus, but you know what's upstairs of the uterus? Your diaphragm is contracting like crazy to help push the baby out. Um, but you can't feel it. That's the thing about the diaphragm. It is devoid of, of sensory receptors. In fact, there's only about six of them, and they're located in the crura, the, the parts that connect to your lumbar spine. So you can't sit here right now, Sean, and tell me where your diaphragm is. You can tell me where your bicep is. You can take your mind and you could crawl it to your biceps and you're like, I know where my bicep is. I can tell how much, how short it is. Or I can tell how long it is. But you can't sit there and sense the location of your diaphragm. You were created in such a way that you don't have to worry about the 22,000 reps a day that your respiratory diaphragm does. And that can be problematic because if your diaphragm is um, not, well, this is where I'm going to get a little bit on the, the body by breath, your diaphragm may not necessarily be optimally being used in your body because of injury, because of the habit of posture, or because of our own emotional stuff. We may be um, short training our diaphragm from full range of motion. And our diaphragm can be better optimized, I'd say. I mean, culture has kept our bodies, you know, in chairs and in front of computers, and we are more in a C shape now than we are in an S shape for the most part. And your diaphragm, I mean, you can breathe around that. Your airway will adapt to any shape. That's the amazing thing about yeah. the, the, this caster within your rib cage. It can accommodate any shape, and I can still breathe, right? But I probably don't have many options if I'm stuck in a single shape all the time. If I don't spread that tarp, spread the trampoline in all of the ways that it, it can move. Pressure on parts 
is a very valuable therapeutic application. What I mean by that is self-massage. So the because we we have been so like the brain is everything and all your thoughts and all the things but as i illustrate with my own story i was i was a talking head i mean my body was moving i couldn't feel most of it and so i needed and i think many people need something to illuminate the experience of sensation your body thinks and feels you are a sensational being we have so many sensory neurons throughout our body that are helping our brain to orient us to our environment. Um, recently, there was a, a recalculation of the number of sensory neurons in your fascial tissues. So previously, they thought there were maybe about 100 million sensory neurons in your fascia. And your skin, for comparison, has about 200 million, and your eyes have about 150 million sensory neurons. Um, but this recalculation, which was done by this uh, researcher, Martin Grunewald, uh, basically concluded that there are 250 million sensory neurons in your fascial tissues providing feedback about, well, about the proprioception and about the interoception and about temperature and pain and all sorts of things. These things terminate in your fascial tissues. Even when you have terminations, obviously, I mentioned the eyes, the skin, there's terminations lots of places, but that makes our fascial tissues the largest sensory organ we have in our body. And so, um, you know, your, your brain is everywhere in your body, right? I mean, it's calculating it up here, but my body thinks in feels. My body thinks by feeling. That's how my brain gets its thinking. Um, and that's one of the messages that I, that I broadcast in the book. Your body thinks in feels. And if we're cut off from feeling, we're really trapped. We're really trapped in our head and isolated from ourselves. So using tools to pressurize, to agitate, to um, traction, to promote um, touch brings us back to sensation, to, be, to being a somatic being instead of just being a heady, thinking -y being all the time. Doing the work of truly refilling our, our souls and our pictures and our physiology. It's actually very, very simple to do that refill. And I outlined it in the book. It's called the five P's of the parasympathetic nervous system. This is the, the ability to build a tolerance for parasympathetic state. Many of us are running because we're running from something or we're afraid of something. The ability to not just to stop and be still because stillness can be terrifying to many bodies, especially bodies that are running, running scared, um, or running toward. It's not just running scared, we're also running toward. We have ambitions, we have goals. There's this phenomenon called relaxation-induced anxiety that I discovered a few decades ago, and it just stuck with me. I was like, wow, relaxation-induced anxiety. That's the phenomenon when you start to go into relaxation states where you start to get anxious about letting go, about your vulnerability. Sometimes I see in the classroom when people go into Shavasana or corpse pose, you know, at the end of the class, they can't be still. They're fidgeting, their eyes are opening and closing. Um, that's when the pain starts to set in for some people. When they start to get still, when they're finally still, all of the things that have been submerged during all the action it becomes visible, it's uncomfortable, it's untenable. Relaxation-induced anxiety, there's some estimates that between 17 and 53% of people experience this, which I think is why meditation hasn't really stuck in the general population, because it's uncomfortable. So how do we help bodies that are, that seem meditation resistant or relaxation resistant, how do we help them to find a way to refill and I think these five Ps are a, a really good formula to help not only those bodies, but the bodies that like stillness too. And those are, the five Ps are, number one is perspective. And perspective has to do with mindset. Like mindset, and those are throughout the book. And Body by Breath, I have dozens of them. But one of them is, all of me is welcome here. 
That includes the anxious part of me, the part that can't sit still. Oh, you're welcome here too. Come here, fidgeter. We're going to hang. You want to fidget? Let's fidget. The second P is place. Ideally, to truly relax, the place needs to be safe. Now, in the throes of, of a stress moment, and that can happen you know, on the street, it can happen on an airport, it can happen you know, on the airplane. I was on the airplane yesterday hitting a lot of turbulence. I was like, okay, this is a safe place. Didn't believe it at all, right? But I had to go through, I was like, okay, let me think of the physics of clouds and airflow and the airplane wings. I literally had to go there to make the place safe for me. So ideally the place is, is sanctuary-like. It's where you feel at peace. And that could be outside, it could be inside. Um, for true relaxation, physiologically, it should be warm, it should be a little bit dark, it should be quiet. The third P is position. And I don't mean posture. Position, in terms of your physiology, where you're gonna find the greatest relaxation response is on the ground, is laying down, or slightly in a gentle slope, a little bit reclined. So um, there are a number of positions you'll see throughout Body by Breath where I have the pelvis is lifted up on a block or on a gorgeous ball so that you create what's known as the baroreceptor reflex in your body and that is a helps the vagus nerve to come online and tamp down on sympathetic outflow so you've got perspective place position now the fourth p we didn't even get to this till now is pace of breath so pace of breath is how you're organizing those breath reps that you asked me about so early in our conversation Ideally, your exhale is longer than your inhale. Now, there are paradoxical breath strategies you can do where you, you load your inhale, um, but for the just grand scheme, your exhales are longer than your inhale. That helps the vagus nerve to come online. And then the fifth P is palpation. Obviously, I use role model balls, but palpation means you are using something or even your own hands to press, to conform into different spots on your body and ideally, there are these spots within the axis that I identify that are these kind of vagal portals of pressure that really help the vagus to also um, become more and more dominant and to quiet the sympathetic nervous system, to quiet these unknown braces, these unknown barriers to relaxation. Accidents and injuries happen in both younger and older demographics, but consistent exercise is proven to reduce the risk of injuries and accelerate recovery when injuries do occur. Now, does exercise provide a science-backed defense? A meta-analysis of 25 randomized controlled trials published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine found that specific forms of exercise, those being proprioception training and strength training, can reduce approximately two-thirds of sports injuries reduce two thirds of all sports injuries if those types of training are utilized consistently. And the researchers found that overuse injuries could be nearly cut in half by utilizing those two forms of training. And proprioception training, if you're wondering about that, we're gonna talk more about that later in the show. But this is, proprioception is your body and nervous system being able to navigate your body in the environment, navigate your body in space and training specifically so that your body is adapting to the conditions that you're putting it under. And so again, we'll talk about that a little bit later and how to do it because you definitely want that in your superhero utility belt. So does exercise provide science-backed defense against injuries? Yeah. And also another study, and this was looking at the influence of exercise and injury healing of older adults aged 55 to 77. And this was published in the Journals of Gerontology, Series A. They had 28 participants, and they split them into an exercise group and a non-exercise group. Then the researchers essentially stabbed the study participants to see how fast they'd heal. Guess what? Mm, stab it. Um, <laughs> this reminds me of Harlem Nights. She was like fighting with Eddie Murphy's character. She was like, nah, I got to cut you. But they... They gave them a little, a little wound, a little, a little cut. They didn't just come, you know, like scream, stab them, but just gave them a little, a little, a little cut. And interestingly, they had the exercise group begin exercising three times a week for a month 
prior to cutting them and then had them continue their exercise program afterwards. All right, so they got them fitter first. So they're already in motion, right? They're exercising three times a week prior to stabbing, prior to getting this wound. Now, after compiling all the data, the exercise group healed about 25% faster than the non-exercising control group. Don't you wanna heal faster when shit happens? Don't you wanna heal faster? Being fit is a superpower in this context. Now, the question is, how does it work? Well, number one, exercise is a key driver of circulation, right? So our cardiovascular system, blood is providing oxygen and nutrients that aid in repair. Movement delivers nutrient-rich blood supply to the site of an injury. It's just what it does. It's what your body does when we're moving. There's this wonderful statement in higher echelons of physical therapy that says, motion is lotion. Motion is lotion. Where there's another guild of you know injury treatment that's just like, don't do anything. Just like kind of debilitate an organ, a tissue, a side of the body that's injured and don't move it at all. When in reality, not doing anything is one of the worst things you could do. Now, this doesn't mean if you have a severe leg injury that you go and you're doing box jumps and squats, all right, back squats. It means that do what you can. If you can get some steps in, if you could do a stationary bike, if you can work on your upper body, do what you can to get some blood flow, to activate those myokines, and again, your muscles are an endocrine organ. It's gonna help with pain, it's gonna help with the adaptation, it's gonna release anabolic hormones that help to repair things like HGH. The list goes on and on, a lot of benefits. So number one, circulation. Another reason why exercise is so effective in preventing and also accelerating the healing of injuries is waste removal via the lymphatic system, via our blood, via our eliminatory organs. Your lymphatic system is your extracellular waste management system. And it's a site for a lot, the immune response, the inf inflammatory response of our body, that's the immune system. So when you have an injury, your immune system is there to take control and kind of recruit all the elements in order to heal. That they create the inflammation calling in the troops. And so to help to flush out metabolic waste, your lymphatic system is gonna be important in that. And your lymphatic system doesn't have a pump like your circulatory system does. And so your moving is required in order for you to move out the garbage, all right? So again, waste removal. Another aspect of why exercise is so important in this particular regard is the production and release of stem cells. The Journal of Muscle Research and Cell Motility affirmed that exercise can boost the supply of adult stem cells. Now, what do stem cells do? Stem cells become whatever you need. Stem cells become, if, the, if you need muscle fibers, if you need new tissue for your meniscus, right? Stem cells have the capacity. Now, with adult stem cells, they're more specialized, all right? They're not like totipotent and pluripotent stem cells that we talked about with Dr. Bob Hariri in a previous episode. He's one of the foremost experts in the world in stem cells. Put that for you in the show notes, but there's a lot of capacity with adult stem cells. And again, you're not going to be secreting. You're not gonna release. You're not gonna bust out your stem cells if you're not moving your body. In particular, weight-bearing exercise really helps with the release of stem cells. Another reason why Exercise is so important and valuable with accelerating the healing from injuries and preventing injuries is the myokines, going back to the myokines. Research published in Advances in Clinical Chemistry states, quote, exercise-induced myokines can exert an anti-inflammatory action that is able to counteract not only acute inflammation due to an infection, but also a condition of low-grade inflammation. All right, so effective against infections, effective against inflammation from an injury, myokines are that deal. There is the most recent mind-body unity studies that we ran, um, and did this with Peter Rungo, my graduate student. So uh, we take people and we inflict a wound. 
Now, um, I'm not sadistic, and even <laughs> if I wanted to really hurt you, the review committee isn't going to let me. So it's a minor wound, but it's a wound. And people are in front of a clock, and for a third of the people, again, unbeknownst to them, the clock is going twice as fast as real time. For a third of the people, it's real time. For a third of the people, it's half as fast as real time. Most people would assume the wound's going to heal when the wound's going to heal, right? Based on, quote, real time. But that's not what happens. What happens is the wound heals based on perceived time, the time the clock tells you. Right? So clearly, people are healing themselves faster. And I think that the medical world, you know, when, when you, if you were to break your leg or something um, and um, you ask the doctor, you don't have to ask, they'll volunteer the information, how long it's going to take you to heal, they give you the outer end, you know. And I think that people should be told the fastest healing that we know of so far has been um, so that you organize yourself differently. You know, when, when you're expecting it to take forever, you don't pay any attention to it, really. And there are things you can attend to to uh, um, increase uh, the healing process. It's interesting. I have a close proximity situation. Last year, I tore my calf muscle, and the prognosis was four to six weeks mm -hmm. to return to normal activity, and I did it in three weeks. Yeah. I was, just, yeah. you know, doing squats and lunges and all the things, and... What I share with my audience, and also, I, funny enough, I was doing a talk in Mexico um, shortly thereafter and talking about some of the benefits of being fit and whatnot. And there is some data affirming, you know, if you are fit and you, you do have more resilience against injuries sure. and recover faster. But the most important thing was my thought process because I immediately, as soon as I heard the prognosis, I was like, I'll do it faster than that. Yeah, no, that's, that's beautiful. And that's the way we should all be. Uh, smashed my ankle years ago. Didn't break, smash. And um, the doctors told me um, that I'd never walk without a limp. Uh, now, I don't really listen, so I didn't, know, <laughs> I didn't remember that they told me that. And, you know, it hasn't affected my tennis or anything else. You know, I don't have a limp. What people need to understand is that medical science, like all science, depends on experiments that can only give us probabilities. If you run an experiment, and you do the exact same thing again, which you can never do, exactly the same thing, you're likely to get the same findings. Those probabilities are translated as absolutes. All right, so if most people take four weeks to heal, doesn't mean all people take four weeks to heal. And this came home to me years ago in the, the oddest um, situation. I'm at a horse event, and this man asked me if I'd watch his horse for him because he's gonna get his horse a hot dog. I'm a straight A student. I'm the one you hated. You know, I mean, I memorized everything. I know horses don't eat meat. And I have to keep myself from laughing at this man. He comes back with the hot dog and the horse ate it. And I loved it. Most people, would, you know, so I knew that everything I thought I knew could be wrong. But the reason I loved it is that opened up a world of possibility. That means everything that we know uh, can be otherwise. So this is really bringing to bear, and I, and I want to encourage this in everybody. And this is something I try to do frequently, and also myself, because you can catch yourself being the expert. Sure. You know, yeah. but really bringing a, a mind of curiosity, a childlike mind to things, and resisting being the expert who knows this is what it is, this is how things are, and start to notice that in yourself. And when, because when you do that, you start to miss out on this vast spectrum of possibilities. Sure. Because sure. as you just said, no two studies even are ever the same. Yeah. It's impossible. Exactly the same, right. right. Now that um, essentially the medical world gives us best guesses. And those best guesses are um, um, accepted as absolute fact. And there are some things that some doctors say, not the best doctors, but that I can't, in today's world, it's just mind-boggling to me that they would tell you, you have six months to live. Hmm. There's no way they can know that. You know, um, and there are lots of things that are done that I think are implicitly uh, following the hanging crepe philosophy. Do you know what that is? Many years ago, um, when somebody was dying, they'd hang black crepe. 
And so the hanging crepe philosophy is, I could tell you you're going to die. I could tell you you're going to live. If I tell you you're going to um, live and you die, I'm going to get sued. If I tell you you're going to get, you're going to die and you live, you thank me, <laughs> All right, basically. Yeah. And so they they were um, by nature uh, taking the more um, limited view, the the more negative view. Now that we know that these things become self fulfilling prophecies, yeah. um, you know you don't have the right to lead somebody down a path that's actually going to. Cause them, cause them harm. And that's the message for people to know that we cannot know whether something is possible or impossible, but if you don't try clearly, then um, you you're not going to, you, exactly. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. You know, and also, this is, I'm, I'm just again, I'm holding back my excitement. Don't hold back. All right, <laughs> it. here we go. So this is especially today, putting this in the context of how we perceive aging yeah you know there's a big change that's taking place right now with certain guilds of people who are aware of this but you have one of the coolest studies yeah. on elderly men let's talk about that okay so this was the first test of the mind body unity so remember we take the mind and body we put them back together in our minds then wherever you're putting the mind you're necessarily putting the body so we took old men this is back in, I think we read this in 1979, so quite a while ago. Um, and um, what we were gonna do was to have them live as if they were their 20-year-old younger selves, okay? And um, they lived in a retreat that was retrofitted to 20 years. It wasn't quite Hollywood. I didn't have the budget for that, but anything that was a marker of it being today was removed, replaced with uh, books, magazines, um, and posters, everything um, from the past, and um, to talk about past events as if they were just unfolding. So as well as we could, we went back in time for them. As a result of this, it was remarkable. As a result, the hearing improved. When have you ever heard an 80-year-old's hearing improve without medical intervention, or even with medical intervention? Their vision improved, their memory, their strength, and they looked noticeably younger by the end. Um, and so that was the first, it was um, exciting and reason to continue with all of this. You know, but I had a personal experience that was driving much of the research. So my mother had breast cancer um, and it had metastasized to her pancreas. That's the end game, right? So because it was the end game, uh, her muscles were in exercise while she was in the hospital, and you know, people wrote her off. Then it just disappeared. It magically disappeared. And um, uh, I think that spontaneous remissions are not nearly as infrequent as the medical world might have us believe. I'm not sure. I haven't you know, um, questioned enough uh, medical people to know what they believe. But the common view is we're not going to study it. It's hard to study and it rarely happens. But you can imagine all of the people who don't have access or desire to come to the medical world that, you know, a tumor is there. They don't even know it's there and the tumor is gone. We don't know how often that happens with or without them taking any action to make themselves better. Um, but I think that if you believe that um, there's nothing you can do to help yourself, then you're not going to do anything. Yeah. And if you believe that you're dying, the system starts to turn itself off um, and that we can exert enough control just by assuming that we're going to be better you organize yourself differently you know you you're more mindful and i've got four or five investigations showing that when people are more mindful they live longer first and foremost what is regenerative medicine and let's just start there yeah at, at a very high level it's basically just repairing or regenerating tissue back to a previous state so you're basically trying if your body's in a degenerative state or if there's some sort of damage, you're trying to take that back to the way it was. So the perfect example is like a tear in the muscle or tendon. So instead of getting the standard of care would be like surgery, like you have to go get surgery, you sew it back together and then you're kind of on your way. So instead of having to get surgery, is there something we can do to kind of manipulate the body so that it will heal? 
and obviously this was a huge promise like even like 30 years ago is when it really started like Dr. Arnold Kaplan who recently just passed away he was the one who coined the term mesenchymal stem cells which we'll chat about but he was kind of like one of the godfathers of regenerative medicine and so it was this whole promise that hey we can actually repair tissue instead of just having to cut stuff out or take this pill or just mask it so it's this amazing idea that instead of having to take a pill to mask something or just having to cut you open that we can actually get your body to heal hmm. all right so first and foremost our body in many ways it already knows what to do to fix a lot of problems but it's having the right conditions and the right signals the right signals <clears throat> exactly and so with this being said let's talk specifically about an injury all right so say somebody has a chronic shoulder injury that you know they've tried all this different stuff and they're just not getting better this is oftentimes when people come and see you yeah so let's talk about what you do versus a conventional approach yeah, and I mean, the reality is I treat a lot of high-end pro athletes as well, like NHL, NFL players, stuff like that. And they have their own team doctors that are orthopedic surgeons. But what's a surgeon going to be good at? Surgery. <laughs> yeah, everything looks like a nail when all you have is a hammer. So unfortunately, this field of regenerative medicine is becoming its own specialty, meaning it's evolving so fast that they can't keep up and they don't they don't really know what's going on and they don't know the nuance. So a lot of times they brush it off and just be like, oh, well, you have to have this chronic pain. The standard kind of orthopedic surgeon will say, OK, try cortisone, which is an anti-inflammatory drug. If that doesn't work, you can take some anti-inflammatory medications and then just kind of manage it with physiotherapy and if after like three six months not getting better then you can do surgery so that's kind of like standard of care it's still pretty that's still pretty the standard approach and but then there's this kind of huge gap of patients that aren't getting better with physio and then that don't necessarily want surgery plus they're I think they deserve access to an option that is viable and so that's where we come in and we say okay is there something we can do to get the body to heal on its own and you you told me your story earlier like you did it just with nutrition and movement so imagine what you can do when you're actually sending signals like the actual raw ingredients in there to kind of help your body to heal so a lot of times we'll do our own assessment with ultrasound i think the best story i like is is when i went to the first time i went to dubai was to treat this man named muhammad alabar he's the owner of the burj khalifa and imar property so he's he owns the six tallest buildings in the world and he's you know, the, the wealthiest man in Dubai, uh, business wise. Uh, obviously, there's a royal families and stuff like that, but he's well connected with all of them. So he flew me down because he had the shoulder issue for 20 years. And it was the same, same story, right? Cortisone, orthopedic surgeon, blah, blah, blah. And so he was kind of like, can you fix me? And I'm like, pretty sure I can. <laughs> and so we did an ultrasound, assessed it. We found some partial tears. And then we just used platelet rich plasma injections to fix it. And for a lot of tendon and muscle tears, PRP is, works great. It's just where we take your blood, we concentrate it, but there's also nuance in PRP, which is the problem. There's different ways to prepare it. How, you, how, you, how fast do you spin it? What temperature do you do at it? Because it changes the cytokine profile, which are the growth factors and anti-inflammatory signals. And I was fortunate because I got trained by Dr. Anthony Gallia, who was kind of the godfather of PRP. He treated like Tiger Woods, A-Rod, lots of people. and he was the one who actually invented PRP for musculoskeletal conditions. Mm -hmm. Like he actually was the first one in the world to do it. So obviously he's, I learned from him. And so I got to learn about the nuance of how to prepare PRP. Uh, but that was just like a simple case where you just need the right signals. The body, once you give the right signals, because the plasma, what is the plasma? All it is is growth factors and cytokines that are just telling your body, okay, it's okay to start healing now. So there's stem cells that from the endogenous area start coming in. There's signals that start coming in and start repairing the tissue. And then, yeah, and then he was, you know, he's pain free now and he's good. And I, you know, his wife also had a similar issue in her knee. So, uh, you know, they were obviously, you know, like, what the heck? How come we never <laughs> had access to? And this man also has access to pretty much any doctor in the world, right? right, right. So it's like if he, if he was struggling with this for years, um, it's really hard for a regular person to know how to navigate the system. And that, I would imagine, that's a pretty high stakes situation. Just a little bit. If you screw <laughs> up, you may, uh, you may not return. <laughs> <laughs> wow, man, that's, that's really remarkable. You know, again, like having access to, you know, all these different treatments, but, and, and trying so many things and just struggling. What, what can block somebody f from healing, you know, when it comes to these signals, being able to do what, what they're able to do? Well, that's, yeah, and that's always fascinated me. It's like, your body has this innate ability to heal as you've seen yourself. But what 
is I think it's a combination of genetics and obviously <clears throat> the inputs you give it. Because if you're not putting the right food, you're not doing the right movement. And then there's always going to be just that factor of just we don't fully understand. But most likely there's some genetic pathways in terms of regenerative medicine pathways, because there's all these different pathways that signal and tell your body to heal. Like there's a pathway called the WINT pathway, WNT. But maybe there's some people who have genetic polymorphisms or some sort of variants that just don't allow their body to heal as well as other people's body. Because I, I have some patients who just, you know, they're so fragile <laughs> and they just don't heal from any, it's just so far, and they eat well, they exercise, they do all the basic stuff, but for whatever reason, their body just doesn't heal well. And so we have to, oftentimes we're working with those patients whenever they get tears, they just don't heal and we have to help them to heal. All right, so you mentioned PRP being uh, one possible treatment, but you, and we talked a little bit about this before we got started, are somebody who's really at the forefront of understanding this and it's super exciting i actually did uh, a lecture on this at my uh the university that i graduated from for their biology class like 10 years ago talking about stem cells that's so cool and i was talking about you know totipotent stem cells <laughs> and pluripotent stem cells and all these different things just what we knew at the time but there wasn't any there wasn't any valid interventions in medicine at the time to really talk about yeah. But we've come so far. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, it's exploding. And so I think for people to understand, because stem cell is such a blanket term, and there's different type of stem cells. So first, just a broad definition of a stem cell is something that can divide and potentially turn into different types of tissue and help to repair tissue. And the, the, the cool thing about stem cells is obviously their ability to regenerate new tissue. And But the issue is, there's, there's so many different types. So there's embryonic stem cells, which come from an embryo. And that's kind of like in the Bush era, there was a lot of controversy because obviously if you're taking them from embryos, that's very different. And a lot of people still think like, they're like, oh, so you're, you're taking, are you taking, they still think that, you know, there's still a misconception. We're not taking them from embryos. We're taking them from umbilical cord tissue because that's a very rich source of what are called mesenchymal stem cells. And mesenchymal is just an embryological term. But the point is these mesenchymal stem cells are still very, pluripotent, meaning they can differentiate into different types of tissue, but they're not totipotent, meaning they can't turn into any type of tissue. So there are certain cell lineages where they have a propensity to differentiate into. And typically that's going to be like cartilage, muscle, tendon, bone. Uh, but that, but we still use it for other organ systems, not because we're trying to necessarily, re, we know it's not going to regrow you like a new pancreas, but what it can do is it can improve the microenvironment and allow your body to improve that chronic inflammatory process that's causing that degeneration in the pancreas with like type 2 diabetes. That's why there's been trials done where you inject just mesenchymal stem cells into the pancreatic arteries and patients can actually get off insulin. And we've had, we've, we've, we've treated patients with that too, with type 2 diabetes. But so mesenchymal stem cells have this amazing ability to heal and reduce inflammation. But then it's like, okay, can we engineer these cells to control the signals? And this is, this is the part that I'm really excited about. It's, it's called synthetic biology. So meaning instead of just taking umbilical cord stem cells and manufacturing them and then injecting them in, we actually genetically engineer these cells in a lab. And then we, how we do that is using skin biopsy. So we take a skin biopsy from a patient. It can be from your own body or it can be a donor. And then we use cellular reprogramming. And this is kind of practicing like the reset button on the cell. It's called the Yamanaka factors. And Professor Yamanaka was a Japanese Nobel scientist. And the reason he got the Nobel Prize is because he figured out these are the four transcription factors. If we overexpress them, you can turn any somatic cell. So you can take any muscle cell, fat cell, skin cell, and you can turn it back into a baby stem cell, which is like embryonic in nature. How crazy is that, right? It, it, people, it's always hard to comprehend. It's like, wait, you mean I can turn anything in my body back to like a baby again? <laughs> like essentially, that's what he did. That's what he discovered. But the problem was with these what they're, they're called induced pluripotent stem cells or iPSCs and or I like to just call them Yamanaka stem cells easier to remember for people so these Yamanaka stem cells the problem was they're like embryonic so they're they're too much stemness meaning they can turn into tumors or they can keep growing and so this issue in the last five years has been how do we use these cells clinically without causing tumors there are still people using them but I, I would caution to be careful just because there's always that risk of these iPSCs or Yamanaka stem cells to keep on growing uncontrolled, like uncontrolled proliferation. So what we're doing is we have we have this unique cell line that has a gene edit 
to prevent uncontrolled proliferation. So these Yamanaka stem cells will not grow into tumors. And that's the patent technology that we've partnered with the company for. And what we can do is we can take these Yamanaka stem cells and we can turn them into different cell lines and then we can control them. So we can almost control the signals that they're going to send. So instead of just being like a, a umbilical cord stem cell, we can control the signals that they're going to send. So for example, we're working on making a mesenchymal stem cell that's specifically going to target aging by targeting the inflammasome. So this is it's, it's genetic engineering. And then we can also create like beta islet cells for the pancreas. That's already been done in clinical trials. There's, there's, I, there's what's called iPSC-derived dopamine-producing neurons, which can be transplanted into the brain for Parkinson's. And that's, that's clinical trial was published this year. And the results were amazing. Patients actually go into remission, and you actually get growth of new neurons. So you're actually treating and reversing disease. You're not just saying, okay, well, I guess you have Parkinson's, so take this pill for the rest of your life. So that's why it's such an exciting field. So, so it's kind of this intersection of cell therapy and gene editing and gene therapy coming together for kind of that next generation of cell therapy. And this would, I would imagine, be a much more lasting treatment yeah. versus, you know, something, again, you got to take a pill every day or whatever the case might be. Yeah, because you're actually repairing the tissue and you're regrowing new tissue that's going to be permanent and it's, it's engrafting. So it's, it's, it's this is, and this is already happening and this is just the beginning. So imagine where we're going to be in like five years or 10 years. It's going to be amazing for people with like chronic illness. All right. So, and I want people to really get this. So essentially the data or the signaling, which once you said this just now, it just makes complete sense because you know, we're so fascinating. Life is so fascinating, but there's data when we're born, there's data in our cells, in our genes to make an adult. The mm -hmm. data's there, right? But it's just a matter of signaling. It's a matter of, um, I would imagine, you know, certain things getting read a certain way. The same thing holds true as an adult. There's data there for a younger you. Mm -hmm. And you are talking about innovations that can read that data to control the signaling to start to basically print younger copies of ourselves. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's the holy grail, I would say, of anti-aging medicine would be epigenetic reprogramming, which means basically imagine one day we can just reprogram all your cells back into a younger state, which is not science fiction. Like I think that would happen at some point. For now, what we can do is we can still infuse these stem cells into your body which has a systemic effect on inflammation. They're immunomodulatory. So meaning, because a lot of people think they're like, why would you put stem cells intravenously? Because they think, you know, you're trying to repair tissue and regrow tissue. But stem, the first generation stem cells, especially more than anything, are signaling molecules, meaning they are going to help to reboot or reprogram your immune system, which is called immunomodulation. And that's why it's been shown to help with like inflammatory bowel disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, all these different conditions that are autoimmune based because it's rebooting the immune system because your immune system is kind of becoming haywire. So it's like, how do you get it back to a state where it's not it's sending the wrong signals anymore? Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. Mindfulness as I study, it has nothing to do with meditation. Meditation is fine, it's just different. It's the simple process of noticing. And when you're noticing, the neurons are firing and 45 years of research shows that it's literally and figuratively enlivening.